By the end of March, I was well enough to leave the hospital. I spent ten days at Beppu, a famous resort on the east coast of Kyushu. There, as so many tourists do, I buried myself in the hot volcanic sands of the beach and felt new strength flowing into me as I relaxed and let my cares drift away. Soon I became anxious to return to duty. The job of a submarine captain is to captain a submarine. Other men I knew had their health broken completely. They never fully recovered, I had, and I wanted to return to sea. Back at Rabul, our forces were digging in. Practically every above-ground facility had been destroyed in the bombings. Submarine headquarters had been moved ashore into caves. Then it was decided that command of submarine operations would no longer be based on New Britain. Itakura took Admiral Awada and the staff of Subron 7 to Truk in I-41, arriving there March 25th. After that, transport submarines operated out of Truk for a while. The enemy had little trouble securing the marshals, and American air bases there made Truk a dangerous place to be. Our surface ships departed, and troops moved in to build defences and make Truk difficult for the enemy to take. Some of Koga's battle fleet went to Japan, some to Palau. Vice Admiral Takagi was not to be at Truk much longer either. Our high command did not even try to put a bold face on the Marshal's defeat. Its published communiques claimed the sinking of two cruisers, three destroyers, and thirteen transports as a result of American attacks on our southern holdings, and one communique admitted that our Kwajalein garrison was vanquished, while saying that civilians there joined our troops on one last glorious attack. Things grew worse on New Guinea. The enemy had all the naval support he needed, and our forces had none. They kept getting pushed back. Americans and Australians continued to make landings on New Guinea's north coast, capping their campaign with the seizure of Biak, northwest of it in mid-year. General Adachi and his staff were cut off from Japan altogether. On September 10, 1947, General Adachi slit open his stomach in seppuku at Rabul, where he had been kept prisoner for two years after the war ended. His final will, addressed to General Hitoshi Imamura, his wartime superior, expressed his sorrow. I lost 100,000 good men in three years on New Guinea, he wrote. I had to demand of them work, marching and fighting beyond their strength. In spite of such cruel demands, they obeyed my orders without question and never faltered. My heart broke as I watched their feeble strength ebb away and my men die. Adachi closed by saying that he had not committed seppuku earlier because of obligation to the emperor, who had ordered surrender. He had stayed alive so he could see to the welfare of the men under him who survived. When at last they were released from prisoners of war camp, Adachi felt free to join the souls of others who had died fighting for Japan. On February 5, 1944, the Americans made their first airstrike on the Mariana Islands. Four days later, U.S. Army troops landed in the Admiralty Islands and hastened to seize the fine anchorage on Mantis Island. On that same day, I-46, first of three boats in her class, was completed at Sasebo, and Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto, making a supply run to Mill Atoll in the Marshalls, got an excellent target in his periscope about that time. Troops had withdrawn to Mili from Majuro, and RO-44 was taking food to them. On the way back... Hashimoto put up RO-44's periscope and sighted two large aircraft carriers, then a battleship, while he was manoeuvring into position to attack them. Six American destroyers came over the horizon in line abreast, as though sweeping for submarines. RO-44 had to hide. When Hashimoto came up again, the big warships had picked up speed and were moving away too fast for him to catch them. We lost two submarines in March, I-32 left Truk on the 15th for a supply run to Mili, but Lieutenant Commander Masayuki Inamoto's orders were changed en route. He was told to intercept an enemy task force. Inamoto found the task force and reported its position on March 23rd. The next day, the enemy task force found Inamoto and reported sinking his submarine. I-32 had shown up on the radar screen of the destroyer escort Manlove. She and PC-1135 sank the 60th submarine Japan lost in the war. I-42 was sunk on the same day that I-32 sighted her enemies. Commander Tsunayoshi Ogawa left Truk with supplies for Palau on March 15th, arriving at Palau on the 19th. 
He was on his way back when surprised and sunk by the American submarine Tunney. The enemy boat must have had an easy time or it. Every torpedo had been removed from I-42, even those in her tubes, and her deck gun had been left behind as well to lighten her for carrying cargo. Late in March, a horrible thing happened in the Indian Ocean, I-8, then under Commander Tatsunoke Arizumi, torpedoed two ships, the Dutch merchant Tsijalak and the American Liberty ship SS Richard Honey. Many survivors of both ships were then killed by I-8's crew. Some lived through this experience and gave post-war testimony at war crimes trials. Japan, on the last day of March, again lost a combined fleet commander. Admiral Koga boarded a flying boat at Palau and headed for Davao in the Philippines. He was to confer on plans for an intended operation, but never reached the conference site. Koga's plane was lost over the ocean in a storm. Admiral Soemu Toyoda, who would later personally decorate me, took over as our top naval officer. Also, on March 31st, the first of three boats in the I-54 class was completed at Yokosuka. These were I-54, I-56 and I-58, the third of which would later sink the US heavy cruiser Indianapolis. All were 356 feet long, displaced 2,607 tonnes, made 17.7 knots on the surface and 6.5 submerged. Range was 21,000 miles at 16 knots. Plans called for 21 boats of this class, all to carry aircraft, but only these three were built. I-56 and I-58 became chiton carriers, their 140mm deck gun being omitted for this purpose. The boats could dive to 330 feet and had a maximum underwater endurance of 105 hours at three knots. They were similar to the I-15 class, but bad lighter engines and six bow tubes with a load of 18 torpedoes. Their successors would have had eight bow tubes, displaced 2,800 tonnes, make 22.4 knots, mount an aircraft, and be able to sow eight mines. By this time, our submarines were taking supplies to Rabul from where supplies had flowed such a short time before. Lieutenant Commander Itakura again made a successful run to Buin, volunteering for it after Truk received a desperate message. He had his choice of returning to Japan to report for a special mission or making the Buin run. He chose to help our marooned comrades and brought back 73 evacuees. Other lives were not so charmed as Itakura's. On April 4th, the enemy raided Truk, and all submarines present dropped to the lagoon's bottom. I-169 did not come up after the raid. She had flooded a compartment during her emergency plunge, and some of her crew were lost. Among those surviving was her captain, Lieutenant Commander Shigeo Shinobara. An attempt was made to raise I-169, but the lift cables parted when she was just a bit clear of the lagoon's floor, and she had to be abandoned. Another unlucky group was the crew of I-2, headed by Itakura's classmate, Lieutenant Commander Kazuo Yamaguchi. I-2 made it from Truk to Rabul with supplies, arriving there on April 2nd, but she was sunk on the way back north of New Ireland by the American destroyer Southley on April 7th, the same ship that sunk my former command, Row 101. We lost three other submarines in April too. They were I-174, I-180 and I-183. Lieutenant Commander Katsuto Suzuki took I-174 out of Kure on April 3rd, heading for Palau. Seven days later, he received orders to head east and patrol off Truk. I believe his boat was sunk by American submarine Seahorse near the Marianas. American sources say this submarine was Row 45, not true. Row 45 was sunk just outside Truk later. Lost in the Aleutians during April was I-180. Equipped with a rebuilt conning tower, she went there under Lieutenant Commander Hidenori Fujita, who had operated with me as the skipper of RO-103 a year before. Fujita left Ominato in northern Japan on March 20th to keep a watch on the enemy in the north. The destroyer Gilmore picked him up on radar and sank him with depth charges on April 26th. I-183 was the boat of my classmate Lieutenant Commander Takuo Saheki. I was saddened after the war to learn the manner of his death, because he had such a strong fighting spirit. Possessed of a long face and a receding hairline that made it seem even longer, Saheki had been a top student, both at the Naval Academy 
and had a reputation from his teens as an expert in kendo, the Japanese stick fencing. On April 28th, the balding Saheki cleared Bungo Strait, the strip of water between Kyushu and Shikoku, and ran into another submarine captain as courageous as himself. I-183's silhouette was sighted by USS Pogi, which was then engaged in helping to blockade Japan. Pogi fired torpedoes in the darkness, and I-183 went down almost in sight of the homeland. I was well enough by April 18th to be given command of I-47, a new boat that was still under construction. Happily, two of my Etajima classmates were given command of her sister ships. Kosaburo Yamaguchi got I-46, and Zenshin Toyama, with whom I had been so moved at the Sakuma Memorial when we were still midshipmen, got I-48. These were improved I-16 types, 360 feet long, with surface speed of 23.4 knots. They carried 20 torpedoes for the eight bow tubes and could dive to 330 feet. I-47 and I-48 never did receive the 140mm to me deck gun intended to be mounted aft. It was eliminated to make room for Katen. Upon taking over a submarine still on the building ways, a Japanese captain was simultaneously appointed her chief equipment officer. That way he could oversee the final details of her construction. What I had requested of Tokyo headquarters was electronic equipment, a schnorkel which the Germans had promised to provide us and improvements to eliminate all possible interior noises from the submarine. This last item would end much grumbling among I-boat captains. Our submarines were just too noisy. I am sure it caused the sinkings of more than a few. The only request, however, that was fulfilled before I-47 slid into the water was installation of Mark 22 surface search radar, whose antenna stuck up awkwardly from the bridge's forward end. There was no time to make the other improvements. I was not very happy with I-47 at first. Her high surface speed meant nothing to me. I was certain I would be spending most of my time underwater, and that's where I really needed speed. And I-47's heavy displacement was sure to make manoeuvring difficult. I would have happily settled for a smaller boat with greater speed underwater. At first my crew also left much to be desired. Out of 98 men, only 15 had seen combat. So, I pushed all hands very hard, insisting that each learned as much as possible about every part of the submarine. If I-47 were to survive the growing odds against her, she would need a crew that knew every section in her tubing, every rivet in her hull. I did my best to make sure my crew received good food, which was harder to do in a shipyard than at sea. Japanese submariners, like American ones, ate very well at sea. A typical menu consisted of boiled rice, sometimes fresh, sometimes tinned, umeboshi, pickled plums, takuan, pickled horseradish, and nori, dried seaweed. These were on the mess tables in plenty at all three meals. Misoshiro was always served for breakfast. This is a soup much favoured by Japanese. It contains dried onions, fresh spinach, and added vitamin extracts. Lunch and dinner were a little more elaborate. For about the first ten days at sea, we enjoyed fresh meat and vegetables. We ate broiled fish, beefsteak, pork cutlets and tempura, shellfish or vegetables, dipped in batter and fried. When fresh food supplies were exhausted, we would have tinned vegetables, fruit, fish, beef, pork, chicken, broiled eels, tomato stew, ham salad, fish in soy sauce, and soup. We ate plenty of eggs, fresh at first then powdered, and much, much rice. For evening snacks there were dried biscuits and sometimes milk or noodles, or zenzai, beans cooked in sweet fashion for a treat and tinned fruits. We drank very little coffee, but lots of green tea. Our average daily intake was 3,300 calories, far above the Japanese national average. It was high in protein, but I think it lacked in fats. At Rabaul, while I was there, Submarine crewmen used to take rice, cigarettes and soap ashore to the native villages and trade these for fresh fruit. Once in a while, when the crew was very tired, I would allow an issue of sake or whiskey. Overdrinking was strictly not tolerated. Despite the best efforts of shipyard workers, I-47 fell far short of what I desired in a submarine. 
This was due to a basic defect in our submarine construction program tinkering. Americans adapted one type of submarine to their every need, and I felt Japan should have done the same. Another basic defect that led to tinkering was the lack of a strong working relationship between what we might call the operators and the engineers. In fact, in Japan, a great barrier actually existed between those two groups. In America, civilian scientists and technicians were brought in to assist with strategic planning. They were then able to develop weapons and techniques to meet changing situations. For instance, building small escort aircraft carriers on merchant ship hulls and constructing great numbers of destroyer escorts instead of a limited number of destroyers which were more costly. Destroyer escorts did not have to be as rugged and powerful as destroyers. In Japan, the military operators simply laid down requirements for certain weapons and equipment, then handed these to the civilian engineer. Some of the requirements were not technically feasible, others were just impossible. Many included demands for speed in fulfilling them that just could not be met. The civilian engineer had little reason to give much thought to what use the weapons might have, and little knowledge of how they actually served in battle on which to base improvements. He had no chance to originate suggestions. It took all of his energies just to produce what was demanded. Radar was the outstanding example of this poor relationship. Our engineers were so engrossed in keeping up with operator demands that they had no chance to maintain the level of electronic knowledge the American engineers could. So, when radar was suddenly demanded of them, they could produce only crude, unreliable systems, at least two years behind those of the US in efficiency. In the spring of 1944, however, I could not spend too much time worrying about that. My submarine was scheduled for completion in the summer. I had to have my crew ready, so I heaved myself into that task as May began. The campaign for the Marianas also opened in that month, a struggle that would just about break the back of Japan's submarine force. In three months, we were to lose more boats than in the entire first 18 months of the war. Construction of I-47 was not completed until July 10, 1944. During the final phase of her construction, I learned that some of the things promised me in Tokyo would be forthcoming. I-47 was off the ways before I got them, but workmen installed an air search radar set of the Mark 13 type, plus a schnorkel. The breathing apparatus was an older model, inferior to what the German U-boats were using at that time. As for the radar set, my engineering officer, Lieutenant Kikuchiro Tokuzawa, had to give up his sleeping space for installation of the control panel. The enemy troops had leapfrogged General Adachi's positions in New Guinea and his forces were ill-fed and sickly. He had no naval support. By May 1st, our high command had written New Guinea off strategically. Adachi's orders were to hold on as long as he could and make it as costly as possible for the enemy to get past him and into the Philippines. Our combined fleet commander, Admiral Soemu Toyoda, had a big problem handed to him when promoted to the top post. He had to answer a vital question, where would the enemy strike next? Like Koga, Toyoda wanted to husband his naval strength until he could meet the enemy in one decisive battle. His plan for this battle was called Ago. It called for waiting for the enemy to commit himself somewhere in strength, at which time our surface forces would rush out from the Philippines and Singapore to add their weight to attacks made by our planes. With MacArthur enjoying success in New Guinea, it was thought that the next point of enemy attack might be the Philippines, or it could be the Marianas, now that Nimitz had the marshals secured and could jump off from them. To find out what the enemy was doing, Vice Admiral Takagi was ordered by Admiral Toyoda to set up a submarine sentry line across the path the enemy would take moving north from Australia toward the Philippines. In addition, Sixth Fleet was to send submarines into the marshals, where we knew the Americans had some of their aircraft carriers. Takagi sent I-10, I-38 and RO-42 eastward, but since the greater danger and closer one seemed to be MacArthur, Takagi sent ten submarines down to an area north of the Admiralty Islands. These were I-41, I-44 and I-53, supplemented by seven medium-type submarines. As we shall see, 
the smaller boats did little more than provide excellent targets for the proficient American destroyer men, whose anti-submarine warfare skills were improving rapidly. The seven small submarines were RO-104, RO-105, RO-106, RO-108, RO-109, RO-112 and RO-116, all completed since the war's beginning. Sending these boats south was not only one of the war's tragic tactical errors, but it also threw strategic moves off. The boats were skippered by men not long out of submarine commander's school. They had been ordered to the Indian Ocean almost immediately after graduation to give them some seasoning and increase the effort in that area. But, when an attack from the south seemed likely, the seven were suddenly switched to the Pacific. Five of them were lost within a few days. On May 1st, the enemy attacked Ponape in the Carolines. Four days later, Jaluit in the Marshalls was hit. On May 15th, another leapfrog landing on the north coast of New Guinea was made. And, on the same day, an enemy carrier force suddenly appeared behind one of our major defences, the Malay Barrier, the islands through which one must pass when heading for Singapore and the Orient from the west, and launched strikes against our holdings on Java. This shocked the High Command. It gave evidence of the enemy's growing strength, that he could hit places so widely separated from one another. On May 15th, the only submarine we had that was equipped with radar, I-44, left Kure for her sentry work in the south. The radar set was defective, and I-44 was nearly sunk by air attack while relying on it. She suffered severe damage on May 21st and had to retreat. Up until that time, I-44 had been the anchor of an eight-boat sentry line north of New Britain and New Ireland, with I-44 at its northeastern end. The rest of the line ran to the southwest in the following order RO 106, RO 104, RO 105, RO 116, RO 109, RO 112, and RO 108. There were about 30 miles between boats. At this time, Admiral Koga estimated that the enemy had five powerful task forces at this disposal, each one including aircraft carriers. There was at least one in the Marshalls, one near New Guinea and reports had come in on three others in the Carolines. However, Toyoda had no idea where any of them would strike. The main thrust could come across the Pacific from the east, into the Marianas, or it could come up from New Guinea against Palau and the Philippines. A single American destroyer escort, USS England, catapulted Toyoda into making a wrong decision. On May 16th, our submarine I-16 departed Truk, with a cargo of supplies her captain, Lieutenant Commander Yoshitaka Takeuchi, was supposed to take into Buin, Bougainville. Takeuchi was sighted by an American plane. Three US destroyer escorts, England, George and Raby, were sent up from the southeastern Solomons to intercept him. Five days after leaving Truk, I-16 was picked up by England, steaming in a sweep with her sisters. The destroyer escort attacked and sent I-16 to the bottom, our sixth fleet had now come up against the deadliest enemy it ever met during the war. Lieutenant Commander Walton B. Pendleton and the 200 men of his crew, manning a ship that was about half the size and firepower of our own first-line destroyers. That was USS England. The three enemy ships continued sweeping westward and missed I-44. This boat was later attacked and damaged by another force. The trio did discover RO-106. Lieutenant Eyasu Uda had taken this boat out of Truk on May 6th. On May 22nd, he was lit up in the glare of enemy searchlights after trackers got him on radar. When one of her sisters missed, USS England sank RO-106. The advice of myself and other submariners had not been taken. Our submarines had not been scattered, as we suggested, and we had also urged that they not be arranged in sentry lines. So moving further west, the American ships found the next boat in line, ROI-04, that same day. She had left Truk on May 17th under Lieutenant Hisashi Izubuchi and survived the first attack made upon her. But the following day she was found again. All three American ships attacked RO-104, but it was England who got her, the third kill for this light-hulled ship in five days. The next submarine in line was RO-105. She must have been submerged, where radar could not find her. 
and outside of sonar range because the three ships passed her, missing her. They found RO-116, though. What I had warned against during my table-pounding at Truk was happening. The enemy ships had come across the sentry line and were steaming right down it, getting one sentry after another. RO-104 was discovered less than 24 hours after RO-116. American accounts tell that England got Lieutenant Commander Takeshi Okabe's boat which had departed Truk on May 6 and that USS England's captain was beginning to feel embarrassed at winning all the glory while in company with other ships. He became even more embarrassed two days later, when England killed off RO-108, the boat of Lieutenant Kanichi Obari. RO-108 had left Truk with RO-116, and lived only 36 hours longer. Again, the crew of USS England carried out what was becoming a familiar task, it took them only one attack to get this boat. By this time, the air was full of jubilant American messages about Japanese submarines being sunk one right after another. Our intelligence people intercepted all, decoded some, and realised that our patrol line was in danger. A warning was broadcast, Lieutenant Hiroshi Nakagawa, commanding RO-109, and Lieutenant Toru Yuchi, who had RO-112, did not wait for instructions. Both at once changed position, taking up new stations about 100 miles to the northwest of where each had been. This took them out of the sweeping path and saved their boats. Meanwhile, word of these submarine losses got to Admiral Koga. It made him assume they had been sunk by the advance screen of an enemy task force that was proceeding north. When RO-108 was lost, the combined fleet commander was almost positive, but he became certain on the last day of May. When the fifth submarine in the sentry line, RO-105, went down that an attack on the Philippines from the south was imminent and prepared his forces to meet it. He sent no ships eastward, RO-105, the sixth submarine to be sunk by USS England in twelve days, had left Truk on May 17th under Lieutenant Junichi Inouye. It took a lot of killing to sink it. The England force was joined by other ships, including an escort aircraft carrier, and they found Inui's boat on May 30th. He successfully dodged their attack, but was found again the next day. England scored again. The days of May were also deadly to three other Japanese submarines. RO-45 went down on the first day of the month at a point only 20 miles south of Truk. Just 20 miles, it seems hard to believe, but it is true. Lieutenant Commander Yoshihisa Hamazumi had been at truck when aircraft carriers attacked the atoll. He was sent to pursue them, and headed out, the US destroyer McDonough detected RO-45 the following day. Attacks by this ship, USS Potter, and a plane sent Hamazumi and his men down. Lieutenant Commander Sadatoshi Norita had been a passenger in Kanashi's I-8, taking a crew to Europe for the purpose of bringing back the second submarine Germany was giving us. He and his men completed six months of training in his new excellent boat, and, on April 30th, Norita took RO501 out of Kiel, Germany, and headed for the Cape of Good Hope. He was supposed to give a position report at 30 North, 37 West. On May 11th, he reported having passed that location five days earlier. He was not heard from again. Post-war reports show that Norita fell afoul a type of vessel that was to be called by American writers the scourge of the U-boats. This was the American escort aircraft carrier, a ship built on a merchant hull and used extensively against submarines. Cruising with destroyers or destroyer escorts, these ships closed the broad gap in the Atlantic Ocean's centre that could not be reached by shore-based planes trying to protect convoys. An area that German submarines earlier found so full of fruit, the escort carrier USS Bogue left Norfolk, Virginia in the first week of May. During the second week, one of her escorts, USS Robinson, found and sank RO501 in the Atlantic Narrows, that section of water between Recife, Brazil and Dakar, Africa. Buka still had some of our troops on it in May and they had to be supplied. So Commander, Hideo Okada left truck in I-176 with a cargo of supplies for them. The killer of USS Yorktown at Midway was sighted by aircraft, just as I-16 was to be a little later. 
and four destroyers were sent to get her. USS Haggard, Franks and Johnston chased I-176 for nearly 24 hours after making contact with her on May 15th on the east side of New Ireland. Many dozens of depth charges sank Okada's ship, as if to mock Admiral Toyoda. On May 27th, Japan's Navy Day, the enemy chose to attack Biak Island, northwest of New Guinea. His force was reported to contain two aircraft carriers, two battleships, four cruisers, and 14 destroyers. That made the commander-in-chief certain that the enemy intended to jump from Biak to Palau and the Philippines. He ordered the first air fleet, our carrier force, to move down and crush the enemy, pulling planes out of the Marianas for this purpose. He also ordered the second fleet, which included the giant battleships Yamato and Musashi, to stand by for a rush to the south. These were based at Tawi Tawi, our anchorage in the Sulu archipelago, at the tail of the southern Philippines. Toyoda was still busy deploying his forces when, on June 5, one of our land-based planes from Nauru Island flew over Majuro, in the Marshalls. This daring long-range flight resulted in a message that read at Majuro, apparently ready to sortie, our 14 enemy aircraft carriers, six battleships, 14 destroyers, four tankers, and about 20 cargo ships. This caught Toyoda out of position, because he was still working up to an all-out counter-attack on Biak. But he still believed that the Philippines was the enemy's next objective. Perhaps it was because he believed that MacArthur, a man whom our top leaders knew to be greatly sensitive of his person and position, was eager to keep his promise of returning to the Philippines. In any case, Toyoda ordered the battleship cruiser force at Tawi Tawi to start southward to Halmahera, from where it could strike into Biak. Our 6th Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Takagi, moved from Truk to Saipan in the Marianas in order to have a better location, Truk being endangered from which to direct our submarine operations. Again, no ships were sent eastward. Toyoda kept his carriers at Tawi Tawi and waited for the situation to develop further. Contact with the enemy force from Majuro was lost on June 9th, and Toyoda had no idea where it was heading. Meanwhile, an American submarine, scouting off Tawi Tawi, sank three of our destroyers in four days. This was excellent submarine work by USS Harder and her captain, Commander Samuel Dealey, who certainly deserved having a ship named after him later. The loss of five sentry-line submarines had given Toyoda the impression that a task force was sweeping up from the south, and the sinking of three destroyers right off his main anchorage, plus the sinking of a fourth destroyer and three tankers not very far away, plagued him further. Toyoda had to move his carriers out of Tawi Tawi soon, otherwise they would either be sitting ducks for attacking American planes, or be trapped inside a ring of enemy submarines. On June 12, the carriers were still at Tawi Tawi, and Toyoda's heavy surface ships at Halmahera when an enemy task force suddenly appeared off the Marianas, sending in planes to hit Guam, Saipan and Rota. But Toyoda felt this was merely a diversion, an attempt to draw his forces away from the southern Philippines, so that MacArthur could land on Mindanao. Toyoda thought so little of the attack on the Marianas, in fact, that 6th Fleet sent only three submarines, Row 36, Row 43 and Row 114 to that area to counterattack. The three boats were to operate east of the Marianas. All other submarines were to concentrate in the Carolines and in the area north of the Admiralties. On June 13th and 14 reports came from Saipan and Tinian that enemy battleships and cruisers were bombarding them, while aircraft were bombing. On June 15th came word that American marines were landing. What Toyoda had thought was a lure was actually the vanguard of a mighty force containing more than 125,000 men. Toyoda ordered Operation A-Go put into motion at once. It was actually an excellent plan. And it might have worked except for two things, the bright mind of American Admiral Raymond Spruance and American submarine men. The first battle in the Philippine Sea is called by the Americans the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. It might just as easily be called the Great Submarine Success, if looked at from the American point of view, or the Great Submarine Disaster, if looked at from the Japanese side. First of all, we lost those five submarines on the sentry line, 
A sixth, I-44, was badly damaged. Then the American submarines Harder, Puffer, Gurnard and Bonefish sank seven of Toyota's ships. And when Toyota finally gave the order for his carriers to leave Tawi Tawi, the American submarine Redfin sighted them that very day. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa had our aircraft carriers. He was sighted and reported when passing through the central Philippines, and again when emerging from San Bernardino Strait. USS Flying Fish sighted him there. Meanwhile, Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki had left Halmahera with Yamato, Musashi and other heavyweights, his attack on Biak having been cancelled. The American submarine Seahorse sighted Ugaki's force and the enemy knew our ships were coming. Spruance sent fighter sweeps northward into the Bonins and Volcano Islands to knock out aircraft there, thus eliminating air counterattack against him from land bases for at least a few days. Then he stood by to await the arrival of our carriers and battleships. And, before his aircraft carriers had a chance to attack ours, two American submarines scored great victories. USS Kavala sank our carrier Shokaku, and USS Albacore sent carrier Taiho to the bottom. After that, Spruance's pilots wiped out more than 80% of Ozawa's flyers. Our underwater enemies chewed at the combined fleet before it sorted, reported it when it did, then smashed two of its most important fighting units before the main battle was even joined. What had been pre-war doctrine for both the American and Japanese submariners had been executed in a classic manner by our enemies. They did everything right under Vice Admiral Charles A. Lockwood's direction. Our submarines, under Toyoda's and Takagi's direction, did everything wrong. Operation Ago called for land-based planes to attack the enemy's ships, land in the Marianas, rearm and refuel, then strike again on the way back to home bases. Our aircraft carrier planes were to do the same thing, strike the enemy, refuel and rearm in the Marianas, then strike again on the way back to their carriers. Operation Ago was therefore intended to give our air forces twice their striking power. Spruance and American submarines wrecked Operation Ago, our land bases were temporarily neutralised and our land planes made ineffective. Loss of two carriers meant loss of their planes while still out of range of the enemy. The remainder of our air power, sea-based, was overwhelmed by the waves of planes from Spruance's undamaged carriers. And when the battle was finally joined, where were Japan's submarines, completely out of the picture, believe it or not? When fleet forces met fleet forces, our nearest submarine was many hundreds of miles away. None was in the Philippine Sea, so sure was Toyota that the enemy attack would be against the Philippines. Thanks to USS England's accomplishments against our submarines and the submarine harders against our surface ships, that our submarines at Kure, Yokosuka, Seiki Bay, Truk and Palau received no orders from him until June 16th. By that time, communications with Vice Admiral Takagi on Saipan had been temporarily cut off, and Rear Admiral Noboru Awada, heading Subron 7 at Truk, had to take over command of the 6th Fleet for a while. He ordered 12 submarines to form three sentry lines, I-6, I-185, I-184, I-5 and I-41 were ordered to take station in that order about 300 miles east of the Marianas on a north-south line, with I-6 the northernmost boat. Parallel to that line, and about 80 miles east of it, was to be a chain made up of row 47, row 42, row 41, and row 43. Another 150 miles east of this second line was to be a third, also parallel made up of I-10, I-38, and I-53. Awada also ordered eight other submarines to deploy in waters closer to Saipan. These were RO-36, RO-109, RO-111, RO-112, RO-113, RO-114, RO-115, and RO-117. On June 16th, an order came down from Toyoda's flagship in the Inland Sea that all Japanese submarines were to remain east of the 145th East Meridian of Longitude. The first battle of the Philippine Sea took place west of that, so the order kept our submariners well away from where they might have done the most good. The order was rescinded on June 20th, but by that time it was too late. The major damage to our fleet had already been done. The enemy no longer feared our aircraft carriers, which were fleeing. His own carrier planes were available for heavy attacks on our island garrisons and for intensified anti-submarine patrol sweeps. 
From Truk on June 17th, Admiral Owada gave orders for the eight RO-type boats near the Marianas to begin making attacks on the 19th against ships in that area, but they were still limited by the order to remain east of the 145th meridian, which cuts between Guam and Rota. Saipan and Tinian were in the allowed area of attack, since they lie east of that meridian. But four of our submarines were sunk before the date of attack arrived. RO-36, under Lieutenant Commander Tatsua Kawashima, had just made a supply run from Kure to Truk and returned home safely. On June 4th, she left Seiki Bay, Kyushu, with more supplies. This time her destination was Waywak, New Guinea. On June 10th, the US destroyer Taylor, operating with an escort carrier and three other destroyers north of the Admiralties, sank a submarine. Since the submarine broached after being depth-charged and was actually seen in mid-afternoon by American sailors, I assume it was RO-36 that Taylor sank. We had no other submarines in that area at that time. Another boat left Seiki Bay the same day. This was Lieutenant Commander Naozu Nakamura's Row 111. He had orders to sail for Saipan. I think that Nakamura's boat is the one sunk about 100 miles west of Saipan by the US destroyers Melvin and Wadley, which got her on radar at midnight of the 15th. RO-36 could have been in that area, because the 145th Meridian Order had not yet been sent when the American ships made their contact. The third submarine lost was Row 117, under Lieutenant Commander Yasuo Enomoto. He left Truk on June 5th, heading north. On June 16th, he was ordered to take station northeast of Saipan, and was still working his way into position, when an American heavy bomber flying anti-submarine patrol out of Enivatok in the Marshalls sank him. Row 114 left Saiki Bay under Lieutenant Yoshihiro Atta on June 4th to patrol in the Marianas area. She was never heard from again. I think she is the submarine sunk on June 13th by the destroyer Melvin, east of Saipan. This ship got a radar contact not long after midnight, closed in, illuminated and opened fire. Row 114 dived, but was sunk by depth charges slightly north of the patrol position assigned to her. During the campaign for the Marianas, we sent a total of 26 submarines there on various missions and lost 11 of them. American and Japanese records disagree as to the times and places some of them were sunk. Having made a careful study of the missions assigned, positions assigned, dates of leaving port, plus the dates and positions from which last heard, I am sure that my accounting of the lost submarines is the most accurate one available, especially since official American accounts were written and published long before many valuable records were unearthed in Japan and elsewhere. There is no disagreement, however, on the two submarines we lost in the Marshals during this period. They were RO-42 and RO-44. Lieutenant Commander Mokitsura Hashimoto gave over command of RO-44 to Lieutenant Commander Sadao Wisugi just before it left Kure on May 15th for Saipan. From Saipan it went on to the Marshals and checked on enemy activity around Eniwetok. After a second scouting of Eniwetok, RO-44 headed for Bikini. On June 16th it met up with the destroyer escort Hastings at about 3am. Uesugi and his men died not long afterward. By then, RO-42 had already been lost. She left Kura the same day as RO-44 and went straight to the Marshals, from where she sent back situation reports. On June 10th, she appeared on the radar screen of destroyer escort Bangust, east of Kwajalein, a little before midnight. Lieutenant Yoshinosuke Kudo and his crew never saw another dawn. After a while, Rear Admiral Awada passed the command of 6th Fleet on to Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Miwa at Kure. This happened after Awada had given two more general orders. On June 19th, he ordered all available submarines to make attacks in the Saipan area. The next day, Admiral Koga's limiting order was rescinded, giving the boats freedom of action. But it was then too late to help our combined fleet, which had retreated. On June 22nd, Awada ordered all but six boats to pull out of the Marianas area. I-6, I-38, I-53 and RO-47 were to continue to attack when and where they could. I-10 was to make for Saipan to evacuate Admiral Takagi and his staff. I-41 was to head for Guam, where waited many pilots and airmen whose planes had been destroyed on the ground. 
The naval general staff wanted them brought back to Japan so they could fight again. Nakajima had to get I-10 in past more than 100 ships and get Takagi out. I cannot account for the sinking of I-10 on a specific date, but I am sure she was lost no later than June 28th and most likely to an enemy plane. American sources list her as being sunk on July 4th. I cannot agree, mainly because Admiral Miwa had already given her up for lost by June 28th, the date on which he ordered I-38 to take over I-10's mission. Only one submarine appears to have had any good fortune during the Marianas campaign, and even she did not achieve positive results. Lieutenant Hisashi Watanabe took RO-115 out of Kure in mid-May with a cargo of supplies. He stopped at Truk, then Wewak and Palau, after which he was ordered to move in close to Saipan. On June 19th he was west of Rota and fired four torpedoes at a WASP-class aircraft carrier. That exhausted his offensive capability and he returned to Japan. No American carrier was reported as receiving torpedo hits on that day. On June 22nd, the pilots and airmen at Guam were picked up by I-41 and taken safely to Japan. Lieutenant Commander Mitsuma Itakura brought off this coup after a strange plan was abandoned. I have already mentioned that Itakura made a much-needed supply run to Buin, despite the danger, when he could have gone back to Japan for a special mission. His was the last Buin run made. Itakura then rendezvoused with I-36, I-38 and three other submarines in the inland sea south of Kure. Someone had conceived an idea nearly as weird as the wooden torpedoes Hashimoto had been ordered to test in 1942. The six submarines were supposed to carry amphibious tanks from Kure to Bougainville and put them ashore. The tanks were equipped with, of all things, torpedoes. They were to go ashore, make their way overland, go into the water near the enemy beachhead and make a torpedo attack on enemy ships. This would be called the Tatsumaki Tornado Operation. The submarine captains were astonished to think that anyone was really serious about this new thing. First, submarines would have to get in near Cape Torokina, which none had been able to do so far. Then they would have to surface in this perilous area for at least 20 minutes to get the tanks away. That is, if the tank's motors would start, after being underwater for so long. Then the tanks would have to reach land safely, cross it, and enter the sea again. They made a monstrously loud noise, and could only achieve a maximum speed of 4.5 knots. Were enemy sailors supposed to sleep through all this din while these creeping caterpillars closed in on them? The project was finally abandoned. I think it was laughed out of existence. Itakura was then sent to the Admiralties as a sentry during the period when USS England killed off six of our submarines. He sighted nothing, and nothing sighted him. I-41 was ordered into Guam and evacuated 106 men from there, putting them ashore at Oita, Kyushu, near Beppu, on June 30th. Itakura then went to Kura, where he received orders to help establish a Khitan organisation. On the same day Itakura evacuated the pilots in I-41, we lost another submarine, 1944 Junarai's I-185. She was en route from Kura to Weiwak when ordered to intercept the enemy instead. On June 22nd, Arai spotted a convoy near Saipan bringing in reinforcements for the assault on that island. But the convoy's escort also spotted I-185, destroyers Newcomb and destroyer minesweeper Chandler, sent Arai's boat to the bottom. Another diverted submarine, I-184, had been sunk three days before that. On May 20th, the boat of 1944, Matsuji Rikihasa, left Yokosuka with supplies for Mili, an island whose story is one of the war's saddest. Counting the troops who fled there from Majuro in January, over 4,500 men were marooned on this tiny island. For 20 months thereafter they were subjected to bombing and shelling by passing ships and planes, even providing an occasional bit of target practice for new American units just arriving in the combat area. Except for the meagre supplies a few submarines took to them, this garrison had nothing. Over 1,600 men died from starvation, and from sicknesses brought on by lack of food. Another 900 succumbed to enemy attacks, the rest were all serious hospital cases at the time of final surrender. Ricky Husser arrived at Mealy, unloaded his supplies and left there on June 12th. 
On June 15th, he received word to close in on the Marianas. Before he could get there, a Grumman torpedo plane from the escort aircraft carrier USS Suwani downed him with depth charges. I-6 was one of the boats that Admiral Awada, while temporarily commanding the 6th Fleet, had told to stay in the Marianas area when the other boats left it. On June 30th, she fired torpedoes at an aircraft carrier only 10 miles east of Saipan. I think that Lieutenant Commander Shozo Fumon retreated after that attack and waited for a chance to strike again. On July 4th, a group of American escort carriers and tankers was east of Guam. Part of their screen located a submarine that evening. Destroyer Escort Riddle and Destroyer Taylor made a depth charge attack and reported sending it to the bottom. I am convinced that it was I-6. No American sources are correct on the other three submarines lost in the June to July period of the Marianas fight, I-5, I-55 and RO-48. Lieutenant Commander Takashig Doi left truck in I-5 on July 6th for a supply run to Ponape in the Carolines. He got there safely on July 11th, unloaded and made for Truk. Three days later, Doi radioed that he was attacking some enemy ships about 300 miles east of Saipan. We never heard from him again. The ships he attacked were a group of hunter-killers, especially searching out submarines. The destroyer escort Wyman sank I-5 after Doi's ship had been picked up on radar in the darkness. Three different submarines tried to tow Unpoto to Guam to help our beleaguered forces there. Commander Toshio Kusaka left Kure on June 27th with I-26 and after many attempts to pierce the anti-submarine defences unsuccessfully, finally got through them and unloaded his cannon carrier on July 7th. Then I-45 and I-55 were sent to try, leaving Yokosuka on July 7th. Chased off several times by alert enemy patrols, I-45 had the misfortune of seeing her Unpoto washed overboard in heavy seas. She had to return to Japan. This was the second piece of bad luck for I-45 in a short period. On her previous mission to the Marshals, she had been bombed and heavily damaged by an enemy aircraft. The sub barely made it back to Japan. With a wrecked stern, Commander Monshiro Izuzu had I-55. He also kept trying to get into Guam with an Unpoto. Finally, word was sent to him to abandon his mission and head for Tinian, where airmen waited to be evacuated. Izuzu cast loose the Unpoto and acknowledged this order late on July 13th, saying he expected to arrive at Tinian on the 15th. He must have been still sending this message when an American plane sighted I-55 about 80 miles west of Saipan. An ambush was laid and the destroyer escort Miller picking up I-55 on radar next morning. Miller was still making depth charge attacks when her crew heard a great explosion. It was I-55's death cry. RO-48 was the 11th of our submarines to be sunk in Marianas operations. She left Kura on July 5th under Lieutenant Commander Seta Kazutomi. On July 14th, she reported undergoing a severe depth charging only 30 miles east of Saipan. It was the last message received, I think, that Kazutomi limped away from that attack and tried to make battle repairs. Then, shortly before sunset on July 28th, a hunter-killer group built around the escort carrier USS Hoggart Bay found RO-48. Destroyer escorts Wyman and Reynolds sank her quickly. After being raised at Truk, refloated and towed home, I-33 was refitted. Lieutenant Commander Mutsu Owada was given command of her, and in June was giving refresher training to his crew in the Inland Sea, as well as shakedown training. On the 13th, at 8.40am, Wada ordered a sudden dive, I-33 did not come to the surface again until nine years later, when it was salvaged and the bones of Wada and 89 other submariners recovered. The reason for the sinking of I-33 was the same as that for the sinking of USS Squalus in 1939, the American submarine that was recovered and refitted to fight against us as USS Sailfish. The main induction valve had not closed. This is the opening through which submarines of that period breathed while running on the surface. It had to be closed when they dived. If not, a great column of seawater poured into the submarine, weighing her down. USS Squalus was found, and the McCann diving bell was used to rescue those of her crew who were still alive. In the case of I-33, she was located. But we had no method of saving her men, even though they were in only 180 feet of water, 
a much shallower depth than Squalus. Wada and his crew must have suffered awfully before suffocation finally brought them death. I-52 was lost in the Atlantic. She had gone there under Commander Cameo Uno, carrying a cargo of rubber, tin and tungsten. She met a U-boat off Biscay Bay, but no report of her arrival in Europe ever got to Japan. After the war, we learned that I-52 was the victim of airborne radar and a weapon called the Sonoboy. The Sonoboy, when dropped into the water from an aircraft, acted both like a sound detection station and a radio station. Its sonar portion established the range and bearing of an underwater object, and its radio portion sent this information to aircraft in the sky. Three aircraft from the US escort carrier Bogue discovered, depth-charged and sank UNO's boat on June 24, 1944. In July, we lost a submarine to a British submarine. I-166 was summoned east from the Indian Ocean, so Lieutenant Commander Shoichi Nishiuchi took her out of Penang on July 16, heading for a rendezvous with fleet units off Singapore. I-166 was ambushed the following night by HMS Telemachus. Nishiuchi, fortunately for him, was on the open bridge when the enemy's torpedoes hit. I-166 sank from under him. He and a few others were picked up by a friendly craft in the Malacca Strait. I-29 was sunk by a submarine also, under Commander Takaichi Kinashi, the ace of our submarine fleet. She had gone to Europe. Kinashi brought his boat back safely as far as Singapore, loaded with machine tools and other valuable devices for our war industry, plus new weapons. He departed Singapore for Kure on July 22nd, four days out. He was sunk by USS Sawfish, south of Formosa. Some of I-29's crew survived, but Kinashi did not. He went down with his ship. Organised Japanese resistance on Saipan ended on July 9th. Admiral Takagi and his staff had perished two days before that in a Banzai attack. Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, who had led our aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbour, in the Indian Ocean, at Midway, and in the Solomons, committed seppuku on Saipan at that time. Tinian men continued to fight as units until August 1st. And Guam, after being pounded by enemy ships and planes for a month, was invaded on July 21st. The Marianas were lost and the Tojo cabinet fell, at Kure, late in July, our new commander of submarines. Vice Admiral Miwa held a conference to study what had happened to our boats in the 12 weeks since the Naval General Staff had handed down preliminary orders for Operation Ago. Those captains who had been badly battered by the Americans and barely returned to Japan alive had plenty to say. They pointed out that nine of the submarines lost in the Marianas had been pulled out of the Indian Ocean, were manned by men just out of submarine school, or both. Captains of such submarines, they said, had no knowledge of the latest American developments and techniques in anti-submarine warfare. Lieutenant Hisashi Watanabe, Colorado of RO-115, was most vehement. He attacked the Kure school staff for adhering to obsolete curricula, and making no change in their approach to tactics. These people are too slow in developing means for use against the enemy, he said. Rear Admiral Keizo Yoshimura, Chief of Staff to Admiral Ozawa, who commanded our aircraft carriers in the Philippine Sea Battle, was caustic in his reply to Watanabe. In the Marianas Battle, he said, the American submarines performed brilliantly. Where were Japan's submarines? What were they doing to help us? Watanabe would have none of this, even from an officer so much senior to himself. He and his friends had fought too hard. His tongue was just as sharp as Admiral Yoshimura's as he answered. You know very well, Admiral, that Admiral Toyoda himself ordered us to stay out of waters that were expected to be the battlefield. Therefore you must know very well why we could not meet and strike at the enemy. Having gone this far, Watanabe felt that he might as well go all the way. Before criticising us submariners for supposedly having failed you, he said, you may first reflect on the defeat of your own air and surface forces, and on how well American submarines were able to perform against you. If our submarines are to enjoy any degree of success in the future, you will have to stop underestimating the ability of men the enemy sends against our submarines. It is excellent, you think of nothing but the clash between two great surface fleets, you completely ignored us and the men who fought against us. After that, there was a great commotion in the conference room, but Watanabe had made his point. 
Had our submarines been ordered west of the Marianas, we might have been able to make inroads on the enemy's strength, just as his submarines had been able to slice away a great deal of ours. We might have avenged the carriers Shokaku, Taiho and Hiyo, which were lost in the Philippine sea battle, and the enemy might not have then been able to turn the full force of his power against Japanese submarines, the only sea force that opposed him in the Marianas after June 20th. Everyone began shouting opinions, charges and countercharges when Watanabe finished talking. Nothing could be resolved, and the meeting adjourned on an angry note. It was some days before a new policy was drafted and a statement issued, 